Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Town Talks. It's July 1st, 2022, on a, the beginning of a three-day holiday weekend. I'm Newell Arnerich, Mayor of Danville, and this morning we're going to be joined by three really interesting people who are going to share how the roles of advocacy work at both state level and a little bit about federal level and how we as a group of cities here in the East Bay and the Tri-Valley work together to have our voices heard in Sacramento as well as um, in Washington, D.C. And I'm going to wait a couple of seconds before I introduce everybody. As you know, we start off with a little video just to kind of get us to wake us up a little music and a little visual entertainment. So I'm going to share my screen and start that video. Well, that's a little introduction. Um, so I would like to um, take a couple of minutes here and introduce our guest this morning here. I'm really delighted to have Samantha Cahill with uh, League of California Cities, um, who is just an incredibly skillful, talented person of bringing a whole group of um, crazy elected officials together and to get us to all try to speak with one voice, which is really hard to do. And Sam is the regional public affairs manager for the East Bay Division for the League of California Cities. Welcome, Samantha. Thank you, Newell. And just for the record, you said crazy elected officials, not me. <laughs> no, no, I'm the crazy elected official, not all of my colleagues. <laughs> You're the one that pull us together. <laughs> uh, we're also joined by uh, uh, Townsend Public Affairs, which is a um, uh, private company, an organization that helps um, cities counties and other agencies do advocacy both at a federal level, a state level, and also does some really other interesting services that creates that public-private partnership. And today we're also joined by uh, Nicola De Luca, who is the Vice President for um, Townsend, and also uh, Andres uh, Ramirez, uh, Senior Associate. So welcome to both of you guys, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. And we're going to start off with Sam. Um, you know, we've we've had the, the League of California Cities just celebrated a date of um, I forgot a hundred plus years of existence. Yeah, we've been around for I, I believe it's over 125 years now. Um, we were originally started in the East Bay, actually. Lots of good things come out of the East Bay, including the League of California Cities, and we were originally started here. Um, it was the city clerk in Alameda at the time was asked to research the road roller and how other cities were using it, their experiences, et cetera. And it was kind of then that cities realized that there was a lot of benefit in communicating with one another and sharing best practices. And then as the state local government relationship evolved over time, it was realized that there is great benefit to um, teaming together on advocacy as well. Um, both at the state and the federal level, but we do mostly state advocacy work. And, and that's great. It's it's an, an incredible organization that really is kind of the glue because as you know, local elected official, we have a tendency to put our blinders on um, and try to just advocate and do things in our own city. But as time has gone on, um, and particularly as as public policy has changed a lot in the past 20 
25 years that there's a, a growing need for cities to, and, and counties as well to join together. Um, and particularly at a federal level that going one city to the federal government, they say, look, you're too small for us to deal with. But if you come back and you say, I represent 1.2 million people, then they'll have a conversation with you. And I guess it's the same at the state. I wanna be transparent about a little history. Um, and Sam, you just mentioned 125 years of history. Uh, my my uh, great uncle was uh, Matteo Arnerich, and I'm gonna show you something. If you can see this, this is an original business card when he was in the state legislature in 1897. He served for four years in the 56th district. Um, and he went on to be the mayor of San Jose. Um, and in those days, mayor was a two-year term and you pretty much were two years mayor and you were out. Um, so he was from 1922 to 24. Uh, anyway, little history. Very um, cool. 482 cities, and I think all but two are part of um, this great organization. And it is a public-private um, partnership, as as you know, as Nicola and Andres is, is here as well. Sam, what what are the issues that you think have been the top things? Let's focus just on East Bay. What are the issues that you think have have really been driving us to get together and, and what are our common goals, you think? Right. So the East Bay area is a really diverse division. Um, I work with 33 cities in Alameda and Contra Costa counties. And I oftentimes like to look at the East Bay as kind of a microcosm of the entire state. And if I can get our 33 cities to agree on something, it might show that that's possible for our cities statewide. That rarely happens. Um, we tend to advocate for issues that are pretty high level that most, if not all of our cities can um, be on board with. And our statewide priorities really ref reflect the statewide, sorry, the East Bay Division priorities as well. Um, the leadership of our organization comes together every November or December to talk about what do we want to focus on in the upcoming year. And this year, our priorities are um, focusing on uh, housing supply and affordability, um, advocating for resources for cities so that they can achieve that. Um, looking at homelessness and ways to decrease homelessness and deal with the homelessness, ho homelessness problem that we're seeing in almost every community in the Bay Area. Um, we are advocating along the lines of um, infrastructure um, and then also uh, climate resiliency and wildfire and disaster preparedness um, is one of our priorities we see. You know, it seems like our fire season is earlier and longer each year. Um, we've already had a few scary fires out here in the East Bay. And uh, so we advocate for resources so that cities can prepare for um, and, uh, you know, be ready for, for hopefully that won't, disaster won't come, but if it comes. It, and, and it's great because you're right. I, I do think um, for the 27 years I've been around that the East Bay League really is that representative. And you know it's complex with the 480 plus cities um, trying to get them together, but it's a pretty powerful voice. What mm -hmm. are the other things that the League of City does? Um, because there is actual lobbyists that we have that are separate from the technical organization you're part of. Mm -hmm. And can you describe the other things? Because I know we have policy committees, other things that allow us, and Danville has been fortunate, I think almost every year for the past 20 years, we've been able to be on one of the statewide policy committees, but maybe you can share about what those are. Yeah, certainly. Um, so we not only have a team of lobbyists in Sacramento that specialize in different subject areas, advocating for our cities every day, um, but we also have an education team um, that does various webinars and conferences throughout the year for um, our mayors and council members, but also city staff. Um, we're kind of structured like a city. We have a city manager's department, planner's department, city clerks, um, et cetera, city attorneys, and they all have their own leadership structure and conferences as well. Um, a lot of people ask me, how do we get to what we advocate for, for specific pieces of legislation and policies? And yes, we have seven different policy committees um, that meet on a quarterly basis. And if we don't have standing policy in a certain area or on a certain issue, those committees discuss that issue um, and propose some sort of position or policy stance that goes to our statewide board of directors who ratifies that, uh, that decision. Um, and essentially those are our marching orders as staff for advocacy. Um, our policy committees range in subject areas from public safety 
to housing, community, and economic development, revenue and taxation, um, uh, transportation, communication, and public works, and uh, others. And yes, thank you so much, Town of Danville. You guys have always been very engaged, and I do appreciate you, Mayor, for always. Uh, I know I believe you're currently serving on a policy committee, and you've served Revenue quite taxation. some years on policy committees. So thank you for lending your voice there. Well, and it's also a, it's a great opportunity as you know, elected official. We're trying to learn every year, every day, so that we can do a better job in our own community, mm -hmm. and. You know, it's, it has changed in the 27 years I've been here. Um, we didn't used to even have in-house our own um, uh, dedicated staff member to do all the reviews of legislation. And, you know, this year, fairly typical year, there were, I think, 2,020 bills originally proposed, um, which is staggering. It would take any one of us about a year to read those bills from page to page. Mm -hmm. So everybody has to divide and conquer. And then we kind of go after, you know, these pockets of what are the ones that are going to affect Danville? Uh, what are the ones going to affect the Tri-Valley? What are the ones going to affect the East Bay? And then the state, we kind of selfishly start there. And um, one of the things that we have done, because we always look, um, you know, where does the League of California Cities stand on any particular bill? Um, we, we list that with the bill we're looking at. We look where we stand um, in the Tri-Valley, we look just in the East Bay where we are and see if we're all lined up. And then, of course, we look what is really important for Danville. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's one of the things that makes it, um, it's, a, it's fun. It allows us to make our voices heard in different ways. Um, but the most, the most important ones that count that, the, you know, it's, it's like voting. The more votes you have towards an issue, the more likely you are to have that heard or make a change. But Sam, what do you what do you think? Um, it, is there two areas that you think right now are the most challenging here in the state of California that particularly affect us? So you mentioned a few high level ones, but can you narrow it down? Are there one or two that you say, boy, these are the ones that are going to be the most challenging, and and why? Yeah. Um, so I think you know issues in the East Bay and for the Tri Valley that are challenging um, are housing and land use for sure. Um, you know, we have a housing affordability problem in the Bay Area. Um, and that's something that sometimes the state and local governments kind of butt heads a little bit on what the solution is for that. Um, you know, to be able to build affordable housing, we need funding to build affordable housing. Cities need help with that. Um, so that's something that we're constantly advocating for. Um, we also have a PAC, City PAC, our political action committee um, that we fundraise for separate from our organization. Um, and that's how we support ourselves at the ballot on certain ballot initiatives. It's an issues PAC, not a candidate PAC. I should note that. Right. Um, but we have advocated for things like housing bonds in the past to also help cities um, attain funding for uh, helping propel affordable housing forward in their communities. Um, so definitely housing and land use um, is a difficult and at times controversial issue. And quite frankly, I have a lot of different opinions about that, even in the East Bay area. Right. Um, probably the other big issue I would say is homelessness. Of course, that's tied to housing as well. Um, but I will say too, um, part of that is also tied to behavioral health, and that is something that cities and um, have been engaging in more and more right. in how that is approached. Um, that's not something historically that cities have tackled. Um, however, they're finding it kind of as part of some, you know, something that they would like to address. So we as an organization actually recently, recently adopted a new policy statement around behavioral health and we're doing more advocacy around resources for um, addressing behavioral and mental health and how that might be tied to things like homelessness um, and public safety. So um, th those are definitely two of our, our major uh, issues that we're working on this year. Yeah, I think, Sam, you hit really two that and, and I, I always kind of forget that we are we're not as cities, we don't provide um, medical services, um, welfare and things like that. That's the role and responsibility by charter for what counties do. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it affects each of us. And I know Rebecca bauer Cahan, our um, local assembly member has worked really hard um, to try to get the, 
um, the coal center set up and to get funding. And I know in the state budget, there is funding now to particularly about trying to get more people into that healthcare portion. Mm -hmm. And the reality is we can't rely upon counties. We have to do our own job. And even here in Danville, we're affected by it, but in different ways than maybe somebody on the Alameda side in the East Bay here. But, um, you know, in the video I played, the one thing you hit on is affordable housing. There was a statistic there. It said 90% of Californians believe um, that there's a problem with housing affordability. And that's across the board. No matter who does the survey, it comes back with that same answer. And it's probably just like with my children. We moved to Danville and actually in back in 86, uh, 87, we had to wait our, for a house to be built. Um, it was one of the most affordable places. It was under... The house, the land was under $100 a square foot. That includes construction, landscaping, and everything. And, you know, today that's a $1,200 to $1,600 a square foot proposition. Um, so it's hard for our children. And our, our children kind of expect, to, well, I'd like to have a house like mom and dad. Well, they don't realize we started in a house that was that fixer-upper. But, but it is symptomatic of what has changed and how the market plays. And I know that's a challenge. And, and Sam, I think you pointed out, while we all share in the East Bay um, concerns about housing and stuff, they're slightly different concerns. In Danville, you know, we're a city town that's built out and was planned to be built out almost 20 years ago. And now out of our 16,700 homes, we're trying to figure out by state mandate that we have to put 2,241 accommodations in place for housing and a portion of that is affordable. Um, that's a big challenge. And, and Sam, what do you what do you think on that issue? How much variation is there from city to city? Do we all agree on that? I mean, you, you have the best perspective. Uh, no, not necessarily. I, I don't think you all agree on that. I mean, I think you all agree that you need funding and um, resources to help um, with housing affordability, um, maybe even resources to help with planning some of this. Because yeah, this is a really big task for your for your town and for your town staff to have to plan this. And a lot of cities are looking at um, pretty big arena numbers um, in this next cycle. Um, so yeah, it's it's a challenge. Um, <laughs> not every city and town has really great accessible public transportation. Um, you know, so that tends to be a point I think too of contention for some cities who are looking at these really large numbers and trying to figure out where to build and what makes sense. I mean, obviously climate change is a really big priority for a lot of our cities in the East Bay as well. And wanting to try to get cars off the road and that type of thing and get folks on transit um, is important. Um, so, so yeah, cities are, are struggling to try to figure out how to do this and make it all fit and make it all fit in a way that makes sense. Well, and Sam, I, I just got to tell you personally, we appreciate your voice, your skill set to keep us, to hurt us all together so that mm -hmm. our voices, even though, as you point out, our housing needs and solutions are vastly different, but we all share that there's a housing problem on many levels. So let's, let's switch and let's go to Nicolo. Um, and we have a, a different level here um, that with Townsend that we actually started off with Townsend because we needed help to advocate in Washington, D.C. And yeah. we started off that. And as Sam talked about the East Bay and the East Bay, East Bay is very diverse, we realized we have um, very close knit economics, social economic issues in the Tri-Valley. And so that's Livermore, Pleasanton, Dublin, San Ramon and Danville, and we came to the conclusion that we needed help for Washington, particularly in the days when there were earmarks, and those have kind of come back, and now they have appeared at the state level, that the only way we could have our voices heard was to get some help on that. Nicola, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what, what's the role, what does Townsend provide, how do you help bring us together and get a voice, particularly at the state level, and kind of your overall scope that you guys do. Absolutely. And, and Mayor, I want to first apologize for being tardy. I was having technical difficulties. I also want to say really impressive about your family member who is the mayor of San Jose. I did not know that. I thought that was really, really cool. Um, so to the folks watching, um, my coworker, Andres, and I, we work at a firm called Townsend Public Affairs. Uh, we were incorporated in 1998 from Christopher Townsend, 
And what we are, one way to look at this is we're an extension of your staff in Washington, DC and Sacramento. Uh, we've got 14 team members here and we're all registered federal and state advocates. Uh, we also specialize in grant writing. And so as an extension of the Tri-Valley Cities, just like you said, we started off with a big focus in Washington, DC, because there was a lot of good opportunities with uh, federal earmarks. And fortunately, they've, they've come back. Um, to the public, at times, earmarks have been used maybe as a pejorative or, or not a, a great phrase, um, but it was Representative Barbara Lee once said it best. She said, you all pay taxes and earmarks are just another form of you getting your tax dollars back for projects that benefit the public. And so working closely with um, the, the mayors in the Tri-Valley cities, we've been doing Washington DC trips to see our delegation, uh, to see our, our federal uh, senators and leaders and talk about our priorities primarily on the transportation side. Um, and then just like what you said, yes, it's flipped now in the state to the surplus for the last two years. We've been working with our delegation uh, and others, the uh, Senate and Assembly Budget Chairs to secure some much needed funding for the Tri-Valley Cities. And um, whereas tip my cap to Sam and the League of California Cities, they do a great job representing cities in, in Sacramento, making sure everyone's aware of what's going on, but also explaining, like you said, you, you got 2,200 bills and I love you. I agree it'd take at least a year to read through them and none of them are in plain English. And so the league does a great job of translating what these bills mean to the average person. And, uh, and so Andres and I, we have the, the honor and a lot of other team members who aren't on camera now of working with you all to ensure like I said, uh, Assemblywoman Barak Kahan is awesome. Senator Glazer is awesome. But making our message out to the pro temp's office, the speaker's office, the governor's office, there's so many different state agencies that impact us, whether it's Caltrans or Cal STA, and just really highlighting what the needs are of the Tri-Valley cities. And like what you said, if you add the total population together, you crack the big 13 cities. Um, and I, I will say, what I, one of the things I love most about the Tri-Valley Cities Coalition, your two different counties, you know, Contra Costa and Alameda County are at times some similarities, but at times quite different and showing that everyone can work together and come up with common priorities. Um, I, we've talked to other legislative offices and they've been quite impressed by the work that you all do. Um, Andres, anything you wanna to add to this? Well, let me, let me just jump in sure, first sure. before we go down there. I was just gonna say, it's interesting, uh, Nicola, if you go back to the mid nineties, um, the Tri-Valley was the first group of cities to cross a county line. We formed a taxing uh, authority um, because we were looking to solve um, regional transportation issues. And then that got us into, wow, we have other issues besides transportation. But at the federal level, you mentioned something and it has changed that there was a time with the earmarks and that's how each Congress member gave back money to their district. And it was pretty fairly done and how that worked. But then those went away and then all of those tax dollars, Congress authorized various departments to distribute the money. And then it got complicated, really. Right. Complicated. And that's still there. So how, how does that work? And, and you know, there's, there's rules and who has the authority and, how, how do cities and how do you help us um, get through those barriers? Absolutely. So number one, the earmark process has gotten a lot more complicated. I'm glad you raised that. In the past, and this is going back to a couple of presidents, private institutions received earmarks. Where we stand now is they've been very clear. Earmarks will either go directly to a municipality or a 501c3 nonprofit organization. No one ever says this, but they prefer municipalities because the trust is there, the understanding is there, and knowing that cities and counties are good fiscal agents, there's a level of comfort. And so what we do, the process is before, maybe around probably September, October, we start working with the leadership of the Tri-Valley cities and say, hey folks, what are some of our top priorities? What do we need funding for? in the one to three, maybe one to $5 million price range, but also understanding that when you go to the federal government, when you make a earmark request, whether to Congress member DeSaulnier or Congress member Solwell or Senator Padilla, they ask a lot of questions. Like why, why do you need federal funding? What have you done on the city side? What have you done on the state side? 
Where is your project? Have you gone through planning? Are you shovel ready? Do you have permits? Do you have entitlements? What else should we know? Are there any warts? Are there any concerns? And so we do a long, long back and forth, very eloquent, eloquent dance with those offices. And then they also say, okay, show us the support. Show us letters of support. We need to know who else is impacted. Is it regional groups? Is it you know, uh, school groups? Is it community groups? So once we kind of land on projects that, that are ready, that have secured some previous funding, that meet the needs of the of our legislators because they're going to you know want to put their name on it. We then go through the twelve various funding bills to make sure they're eligible, because nothing is worse than say we've got Congress Member Swalwell really excited about a project, and then we select one of the funding accounts and find out no, but it's not eligible. Um, and so there's a lot of work. We've got a great team in D.C. that that they're out there um, working on the Hill, and so it's a long, long, long process to secure these funds. Yeah, I'm just going to give an example, one really successful one. It's something most of our listeners and our population probably aren't aware of, but it was probably one of the, the best things that I think we were able to get. I think at the time it was myself and um, the former mayor of uh, uh, San Ramon, Abram Wilson. We were the two lead members out of the Tri-Valley to go back to Washington, D.C. And what we were after was called interoperability. And it was about radio communications that we saw through the Oakland Hills fire, the Loma Prieta earthquake, and a variety of other disasters that the public agencies from police to fire to sheriffs and other agencies could not talk to each other. And what we found was here in the, in the, in the valley, we had a pretty good partner. Our fire department, because of their skill set and their resources, and they did their own dispatching, had invested in a um, a mobile facility that would go site to site and disaster to disaster out of our area to create that connection so they all could talk to each other. So as a result of this Tri-Valley um, uh, wide effort to lobby um, Congress, we were able to get funding to build our own radio system so that Alameda County, um, and I think all the cities now are in it, um, and particularly Oakland, which really had terrible coverage, that now our firefighters, our police departments with one button can actually talk to each other. And it's a system we've already been through the new round of upgrades to that. We have part of Sonoma County. And if it wasn't for that, the, the scale of that, of the millions and millions of dollars it costs to put all the towers in, the repeaters, to buy all the radios, we couldn't have done that. And, and I think that's that was kind of what began to solidify the relationship that boy together because they had kicked us out previously. Don't talk to us as two small cities, Danville, San Ramon. We're not interested. So a lesson well learned and you guys. So let's turn on to us. You have been our local guy. You've been here, um, you know, feet on the street, um, helping us not only as um, an individual town in our needs, but along that, um, the Tri-Valley connection. Mm -hmm. And Andre, why don't you share some of the things that you do and um, tell us some of the success stories that um, you know are coming up and what's you know we'll get to what's the future look like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you, Mayor, for the opportunity to be here and speak with you. Uh, you know, I, I think you you addressed it earlier, but really working together as a Tri Valley Cities coalition between the town of Danville and the cities of Dublin, Livermore, Pleasanton, and Santa Ramon. Uh, we come together as one cohesive voice uh, to be more of a powerful driving force uh, in Sacramento, as well as in D.C., um, you know, with the shared interests uh, for, ranging from things such as, you know, business, innovation, transportation, overall quality of life. Um, there, there really is kind of a mutual feeling of that those things are important in the Tri-Valley communities. Uh, we do develop a legislative framework to focus in on policy areas where there is that mutual interest between you know all five jurisdictions. So we kind of we tend to revisit that every year or two um, to see how the political landscapes in Sacramento have shifted uh, and then how things have shifted in the Tri-Valley and then focus accordingly on those areas. So for example, this year uh, we focused in on transportation climate and environment, economic development, mental health, 
and fiscal sustainability, as well as affordable housing. Um, you know, we sift through, uh, as you mentioned, Nico mentioned, and Sam mentioned, a couple thousand bills uh, a year. Um, but, you know, the way we're able to narrow those down and focus in on the top priorities is A, with the legislative framework that we have created, B, utilizing great resources like the League of California Cities to see kind of where some of their priorities are, um, because oftentimes, you know, many of them will align with the Tri-Valley Coalition and Danville. Uh, and then also being aware of political dynamics on what will and won't move, you know, who the legislator uh, is that's authoring the particular bill. And, um, you know, that's what's so helpful about Nicolo and I being here in Sacramento, our office right across from the Capitol is we are in there every day. We're able to have our fingers on the pulse, you know, walking the hallways, um, having frequent conversations with, you know, key senior staff and legislators um, and just understanding what's going on in Sacramento. And the really, the really awesome thing about the Tri-Valley Cities is we meet quite frequently. Um, there are legislative liaisons in each municipality where we have a weekly, sometimes more than weekly standing call uh, where we go over the legislation that we have narrowed down to focus in on and have a discussion about how things are turning out, how this is gonna affect the Tri-Valley Cities and then figure out if we have suggested amendments on those particular bills and get into the nitty gritty and see what things we can tweak, how we can change the language so that, you know, we can mitigate any potential harms on the Tri-Valley cities, or in other instances, how we can support those legislative efforts to move things forward that are going to benefit the Tri-Valley cities. And, and just to make uh, them better know, bills. I mean, to make exactly. them better. No, exactly. And, and, and the mayor's the mayors of each municipality, you know, yourself included, um, do also play a very big role in that. Um, you know, we, you as kind of the figureheads uh, have a very good understanding of your community and you work collaboratively, I know with your city management, town management uh, and staff to give us marching orders on what is particularly important to you. And, you know, we do this by having, um, you know, at least quarterly meetings, oftentimes in the Tri-Valley, where we'll come together as a round table and discuss these key issues and figure out, okay, this is what's gonna harm us. This is what's gonna help us. How do we address it? What are our suggestions? And I think putting together a lot of very, very great minds um, and the Tri-Valley leadership uh, has you know, enabled us to you know, have some great outcomes. And Mayor, I know you also asked about some specifics. Um, just this year in particular, you know, we, we have been looking at a significant budget surplus on the state and federal levels. And as you mentioned previously, with that comes the opportunity for budget earmarks. On the state level, and this was final as of last night, um, you know, we worked collaboratively as a Tri-Valley Cities Coalition um, and with, you know, the partners at the Regional Rail Authority for Valley Link um, to work with our legislative delegation, Assembly Member Bauer Cahan and Senator Glazer to push for $5 million in direct funding for environmental study and preliminary engineering of the Valley Link rail project. That's so great. that was able to be put in to the Budget Bill Junior, Assembly Bill 178, passed unanimously through both houses of the legislature and then yesterday evening was signed into law by the governor. So that is some pretty that's fast. Just one. Yeah, that's just one example <laughs> of something in the budget world that we are able to accomplish with one cohesive voice, with a whole lot of persistence, boots on the ground advocacy, and even you know pulling in the big guns uh, for lack of better terms, and having you know yourself and your fellow mayors come to Sacramento, you know every year and have those in-person advocacy meetings, not only with Senator Glazer, not only with Assembly Member Bauer Cahan, but also with legislators who are the chairs of key policy and fiscal committees. So for example, about a month ago, we had yourself come down to Sacramento and some of your Tri-Valley elected colleagues. And we had those meetings in addition to our delegation, we met with 
Assemblymember Cecilia Aguiar Curry, who is the chair of the Assembly Local Government Committee, a very powerful committee that has a lot of things run through there that affect municipalities. And then we also met with the senior consultant and chief of staff for the Senate Governance and Finance Committee Chair, Senator Anna Caballero, to discuss these priorities, whether it be funding, whether it be legislation related, what have you. So, you know, ensuring that the elected officials are also there and partnering with us and partnering with the League of California Cities just gives us that extra oomph to be able to demonstrate, hey, the Tri-Valley has a voice, it's cohesive, it's big, here are our priorities, and we've had a lot of success doing that. Well, and I think, you know, for those who are listening, um, Valley Light, uh, a lot of people aren't probably aware what that is, but that's really to connect um, the Central Valley um, and eventually get it to the uh, um, to Livermore so we can get it closer to BART and get the whole train system. And the whole concept is to relieve traffic um, on 580. That now is one of the most critical and most traveled corridor that connects the Bay Area for shipping freight and goods and services. And that $5 million will get that project closer to being shovel ready, which makes it even more eligible, particularly that, that really takes a lot of federal funding. So yeah, that's that was excellent. So Sam, I wanna go back to you. So we have these 2,020 odd bills. I'm not gonna ask the question, why are there so many? What are the rules that there, and most people don't know this, there's a rule. And can you explain like how many bills, is there a limit and how do they come up with that many? What's what's that process? Yeah, and actually uh, Nicolo and Andres, feel free to chime in on this because I, I don't know the legislative rules as intimately as perhaps you do since you, you're in the trenches in Sacramento every day lobbying, but um, I do know there are rules that are often changed. <laughs> so change I, don't they did COVID, <laughs> I don't take them that seriously, to be quite honest. <laughs> um, I don't, I think during the pandemic, they encouraged a limit on bills to be introduced, but I don't know that there's, is there a limit, Nicola? Seven, is it seven? Something like yeah, that? so, and, and Sam had the nail on the head. Something we like to say about Sacramento, and I say this tongue in cheek, there's deadlines and rules until there are deadlines and rules. Right. <laughs> so yeah. a couple years ago, there was an embarrassing end of session, primarily in the Senate, but both houses were embarrassed. Um, so when session ends, the Constitution sets when a session ends each year, and it's, um, uh, so we have all these different deadlines. So a bill has to go through many iterations before it can get to the governor. So it was what, two, three years ago, the clock literally ran out. Mm -hmm. The clock struck midnight and a lot of bills that were priority bills were not able to get their final vote and they died on the floor. And I think there was some frustration and some embarrassment. From that, they set some uh, informal limits. For example, in the assembly, they try to do anywhere between 10 to 15, because as you know, to the public, there's 80 assembly members so 80 times 15 are a lot of bills. And then in the Senate, there's only 40 Senate members. They usually do a cap on 15 to 20. Uh, like Sam said, the first year of COVID, they shelved every bill that was not about COVID relief. Um, and then the following year, they put caps because of we were calling in and doing um, video or online testimony, which took a lot of time. So a simple hearing that would normally go two hours could get stretched out to five hours. There's so many committee hearings. And like I said about the deadlines, it's like the clock expired. Um, so they do put limits on bills. Usually it's in each house at the beginning of the year. You'll hear from the pro tem or the speaker. They encourage some of their members to go within those rules. At times they follow and at times they don't. Mm -hmm. um, but then it's, you know, so right now the legislature is on recess. They're officially on recess until the first week of August on summer recess. And this is when we start seeing that there's so many bills that are out there. They either talk to the author and say, you're not gonna have time this year, bring it back next year. Or they do something that's called chaptering out where maybe four or five bills are touching the exact same government code, uh, but there wasn't coordination. So then those authors have to get together. All of it can be a logistical nightmare. And mayor to answer your question, each house puts a cap on bills dependent on um, who's in charge and dependent on what they're looking at. Right. The legislature is getting away from video testimony. In fact, now it is in the assembly, you have to testify in person. 
They're allowing people to call in to express support or opposition. Uh, but if you are a, a lead witness, you now have to do it in person because the legislature is very, they're trying hard very much to get back to how things have been. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. The state legislature, people may not realize it, in the state of California, it wasn't a full-time legislature till 1966. Um, and it did change. It's like this year is when you add up the numbers, it's an average of 17 bills that were proposed for the 120 legislators. Um, and it does make that challenging. Um, and, you know, we find uh, on the local level, the reason why we're talking about this today, we just, particularly here in Danville, we don't have the bandwidth and the staff. I mean, our transportation department on an average is one person. You know, even our planning department was down during COVID down to one. Wow. But, speaking, but speaking of COVID, um, uh, you guys uh, particularly were able to help our local businesses because of all that focus and all both federal and state funding to help save businesses. Um, whoever, either Andre or Nicola, if you want to talk about what were the things that you helped our local businesses? Um, I know there were grants and a whole long list of things. You did one-on-one -on -one counseling. We, we, the town, paid for that service, but you guys really helped. And maybe you can ex describe a little bit of that. Happy to. And uh, I'll say a little, and Andres, feel free to chime in. I mean, it, we, our firm, we like to say we're champions for better communities. And something that I think sets us apart from others is about the passion for your services and your needs. So, uh, yeah, COVID came and there was a lot of federal aid available for small businesses. And so our team worked with, through the, through the town of Danville, we did something called the Small Business Support Program. So we had a, a handful of coworkers who essentially their cell numbers were made available to all of your small businesses. So say I'm, you know, a mom and pop a dry cleaner, and then you know that there's federal aid. Let's be honest, federal government's intimidating, state government's intimidating. Who do you call? What do you say? How do you get prepared? What information do I need? So there's excitement. You hear about funding's available, but then like, well, how do I connect the dots? So our team members were there working pretty much seven days a week, working with your businesses to ensure here's how you access these funds. This is what you need to be prepared for. This is the information they're gonna ask of you. We'll help get you in touch with some of these case planners. Um, and then making sure we helped make that, it was almost like a, a, an informal marriage and made sure that your business were taken care of and that the funding would come. Um, the federal government had a great program and those funds went quickly. And that's the other thing was ensuring, hey, these dollars are going to go away. So we have to get after it. We have to get active. Uh, Andres, anything more you'd like to add to that? You know, Nicolo, I think you covered it extremely well. Um, it's just more than anything, a, a testament to, to the good leadership in the town of Danville for, for wanting to take proactive steps to protect the local businesses in a time when so many across the state were suffering and, and falling through. Um, so it, it's something, you know, I think Nico and I can both say we're very proud that our firm was able to partner with the town of Danville um, to provide those services. And, you know, that's that's one of those things that just makes working with Danville and the Tri-Valley City so great is just, you know, the, the real intimate connection they have with their local partners and local businesses and, and the, the support they show for them. So it's one of those, you know, feel good moments about the job we do. Um, and it was really great. And you guys were a great extension. I mean, even to the league, an extension of us. And again, our bandwidth has only so many people and so much time because we have to provide all those other services. So it's, it's really been great. Um, and you did, you've saved a lot of our businesses. I mean, when you look at restaurants in particular, which were for a while, given the scale, our average restaurant here has between 80 and 120 employees that were immediately put out of work. That's the average number. Just for a, a small 2,000 square foot restaurant, it takes about 85 people to cover their seven days. And if it wasn't getting those funds that were available, and I think we only lost one, and you compare it to cities north of us, that um, their numbers of losses were huge. And, you know, I think we. We're desperate to try whatever we could uh, to make help. But, you know, we're, we're now in a different time period. We're looking at the economics. Um, global issues are affecting our economics. 
Sam, you know, at the at the state level, from the league's perspective, have you guys been, you know, sort of looking, talking, discussing? What's the future look like? Are we estimating? You know, we've had two years in a row that the state budget's been pretty robust, which is so surprising. Now it's not, but it was last year, given where we were. Is there talk or thoughts? And we'll go around the room on this, but what do you predict next year? Are they they going to have a significant drop in revenue back to a more normalized or any ideas? I wish that I had a crystal ball that would tell me <laughs> all the answers to that. <laughs> um, the state is sitting on a very sizable surplus. I mean, billions of dollars. I, I mean, the number kind of varies depending on who, you're, who you talk to, what you know, consulted. In Over the 90 state, billion. But, yeah. It's yeah. almost what our state budget used to be. Right. So, I mean, a lot of that is going into reserves. So the state is trying to prepare a rainy day fund for, you know, future um, you know, I think a lot of economists are looking toward a downturn of some sort, you know, interest rates are rising, inflation is crazy, we're all trying to, you know, economists are trying to balance this out right now and figure out what's going on. Um, but I mean, the state is in a pretty healthy place. And we as cities have been saying, hey, look at all that surplus revenue. I will say, though, we're like an association for city governments. So there's an association for every interest area in Sacramento, whether you're doctor, nurse, the toy industry, pharmaceuticals, labor, business, what have you, Plastic. manufacturers, <laughs> you know, there, there's an, an association for everything and they're all lobbying for these dollars as well. So, um, but we, uh, you know, have been lobbying for dollars for economic development for cities um, throughout COVID both at the state and federal level. And we've achieved getting billions of dollars coming to our cities um, so that you can do things like help your local restaurants and other economic development and recovery efforts. Um, we also lobbied heavily for um, funding for broadband and achieved getting billions of dollars in broadband funding that we'll see starting to come down to cities so that we can um, get those, you know, those middle mile networks and things like that filled um, and make sure that the underserved are getting broadband. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of infrastructure dollars that are coming our way that hopefully will help spur some economic activity in our communities moving forward. But I think it is kind of uncertain times given everything that's happening in the world um, economically moving forward. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that insight. It is, a, it is an interesting time that all the predictions are, and we're seeing interest rates are nearly double what they were a year ago for mortgages. Um, but, um, you know, speaking of, we've, we've got grants in requests for some of those funds under fiber, um, trying to improve the backbone in our community. Um, but uh, Nicola, what, what, are, what do you see? Because you're, you're both at the federal and the state level. What are you predicting or guessing about, you know, state economy here? And so I'm going to go out on a limb. Uh, 23, 24 fiscal year of the state. I'm going to predict a surplus, but not as big as what we've seen this year. Hmm. Um, you know, there's still the corporate tax. Californians are doing well. Personal income tax folks are doing well. Um, one item I will say is on the federal side with midterm elections, that's going to impact what we're going to be seeing nationwide. It won't impact the economy, but it's going to impact about earmarks or what have you. But I'm going to say uh fiscal year two three two four um we'll see a ongoing state surplus but not at the monumental billions and billions of dollars as we had this year yeah you know and I, i've heard that from others and i'm glad to hear that from you nicola that um and as a 47 year business owner um here in california and hawaii and elsewhere um you know, I, I sort of have that sense in um, people that I work with and other industries still feel, and particularly here in California, that we're going to have that strength, but we're going to, we got to get back to a more normal, um, you know, because what we all worry about, if the state starts spending this money on programs versus one-time efforts, we're going to be in deeper trouble when we do get back to normal. Um, but, you know, there's a, you know, on the video that I played, there, there are three subject areas, and we haven't talked about them, and, and I don't hear the state talking about them as much. They do, but they don't. You know, the, the focus is um, affordable housing, telling studies you're not, it's your fault, and 
pointing fingers and we say, hey, we need money and the marketplace needs money to help build affordable housing. But um, water, power, fires, there is some work being done in fires. There's the governor put out some uh, money um, to help uh, with the firefighting suppression efforts. But, um, you know, there's a, a question that came up here is, you know, water, just drinking water, much less worrying about fires. What's the state doing? I mean, are, 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 we talk about it and talk about it, but, you know, we're just being told, you know, you got you can't use so much power. But yet, I know as an architect, we use more energy per square foot in a building now because we have more technology that we need to do that. And buildings are more technological. So we're saving energy in one sense, but we're also expending it. So what's happening in water? And whoever wants to talk first, what? Uh, I'll take a stab at this. And, and Mayor, when you were talking about, you know, uh, priorities and issues facing the state, the first thing I wrote down was the drought. Um, I'm concerned about it. And this reminds me of kind of where we were in 07 and 08. Um, and I suspect, and we've heard whispers that there's going to be an announcement soon on more uh, water restrictions, probably tighter water restrictions, almost like what we had in 07 and 08. Um, the, the, I mean, it's insane to think that the new normal is waking up in the morning, basically from July through November, and just smelling the smell of smoke and knowing that parts of our state are burning and not just like a little fire here or there, but like fires in the same fire burning into the weeks. And then it impacts, you know, I know that the, the uh, Paradise Fire, the air quality in the Bay Area was very, very, very bad. I had close friends that live in Oakland had to, they came up to Tahoe for two weeks just to get better air quality. So I'm concerned about the drought. I, I tip my cap to the governor. He's done a really, really good job with this surplus directed towards uh, doing some uh, forest fire, firefighting for Cal Fire, some projects on state property about reducing the fire load, um, more on the drought and water tolerance. Uh, I saw the question, I will get more information and Mayor, I'll work through you to share it about what big water projects are underway. Yes, there was a bond, um, but a lot of those desalination plants, Mayor, you know, as an architect, those take forever. To, to build, um, but I am concerned about the climate um, and I am hearing more and more that it's through informal education, whether it's your museums or your science centers or your cultural institutions, they're really gonna make a big impact on the general public to show them here's what's going on, here's what we can do to fix it. Um, I can also, Mayor, working through you uh, and the, the, the town team highlight some of what's in the budget on climate resiliency, because there is a lot. And it's over the years. It's almost like these transportation dollars, there's gonna be billions over four years for the natural resources, climate resiliency, deforestation funding. It's gonna be over four or five years because the projects are so big and the magnitude is so big. Yeah. Uh, but in a nutshell, I will get you more information about what some of the water projects are. I am concerned about the drought. I think that's probably the biggest thing facing California. And I suspect in the next week or two, we're gonna hear an announcement from the governor's administration on further water restrictions and just water usage. Yeah, because it's it's that's going to affect our economy without power, without water, without all the basic needs that drive, you know, modern civilization. You know, locally, um, you know, we meet um, and work closely with East Bay Mud on our drinking water supplies. And I know our, our director, John Coleman, gave an update the other day, and East Bay Mud spent $543 million um, to secure their water rights that they've had for years. Wow. And those are in place. So during drought years that it protects this area. Great for us, but it doesn't help the state. It helps one little area. And it's sort of like taking one from the other. Yeah, they have the right. And I think locally, the only project that I'm aware of is Los Vexqueros. Um, they're raising that to create more capacity. But I think the real question is, are we doing anything in the state and are we advocating? Yes, we're all advocating. And I know Sam at the, the league level, water, power, all that, those are really top priorities that we have to figure out how to, how to keep us into the 21st century. And you look back statistically that California population in the mid um, to late 60s was 20 million. We're 40 million now. 
but we don't consume any more water now than we did then. And we don't irrigate any more acres than we did then. We just irrigate different acres. So what that means is we've been really efficient. And there's almost the belief we've almost got through. There's still some small inroads we can make on more efficiencies, fixing old infrastructure, cleaning up leaks, but not enough to you know, get us back to a 21st century level of being sustainable and things like that. So I think the message there is yes, at the league level and the state level, that is a shared value proposition that it's crucial and critical. Um, and I know as the Tri-Valley, we're, we're trying to work on everything, but it, it's on our list as well. Absolutely. Um, so Sam, I'll go back to you. What, um, in, in the challenges that we see in getting us together, and we're fortunate as you've described that the East Bay because of the diverse communities that we have, and, and it is sort of, you know, the, the, the cities more on the Alameda side have, they're a little denser, they're more urban than we are, and some are very urban. And so those, those cities have different um, needs and issues, but we have found this wonderful way of getting to know each other. And, and I was gonna say probably one of the most valuable things that I've learned and our fellow council members they all get to know each other. And um, I know that's that's one of your real skill sets. And maybe you can share just sort of how, how does the leadership grow locally in the league and how do those people, because we have a really unique person who is local that is the head of the League of California Cities. Maybe you can talk about how that process works and how do, you, how do we get people into those, those leadership roles? Yeah, well, I will say that, yes, um, getting people to talk who come from diverse communities, there is such value in that. Um, and even sharing that with our legislators, there's such value um, for them to understand the specific needs of every community, um, for you guys to be able to share best practices, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Fostering leadership is something that um, is very important and there are so many different ways to become involved with the League of California Cities, whether you just wanna network with your colleagues in the region, uh, maybe you wanna participate in policymaking or maybe you wanna participate in advocacy. Um, I try to talk with our members out here to gauge their interests, their passions, and then engage them in that way in our organization. Um, the more voices, the merrier is my philosophy when it comes to advocacy. Um, so I really do encourage as many mayors and council members and even city staff to get involved. Um, you know, sometimes it's great for legislators to hear from a city manager or a planning director on an issue. Um, so I maintain and work really closely with um, our city management as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've appreciated Danville over the years. Um, you guys have always been engaged, always lent a voice at the table in whatever way, shape or form um, is right for you to be able to advocate for your community and for East Bay cities collectively. And then in that regard for cities, you know, at the statewide level. So um, I, I think that answers your question, Mayor. Well, and also I want to I want to pick up. We're, we're so fortunate. Cindy Selva, who mm -hmm. has been on the council in Walnut Creek, a great right. friend. She is our elected head of that. So the voices uniquely from here, I think we've had two um, local elected people who have headed um, the League of California Cities here over the past 20 plus years. Uh, we've had uh, one of our former council members, one of our planning commissioners who's been on the league board. Um, we've, we've done pretty well in that representation. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, that's a lot to you and your colleagues about getting people um, interested and Danville's worked hard to try to have a strong voice because we can't get anything done without help. So yeah, and Mayor Pratim Silva has been an excellent leader for our organization this year. It's you know been a challenging year with kind of coming out of COVID, but it's still kind of there, and you know a lot of really big issues on the table, both at the state level and potential ballot propositions. You know that we were eyeballing. So. You know, she's had a challenging but very successful and productive year. So we we are definitely lucky to have her there. Yeah, we're very fortunate. And it's uh, easy to pick up the phone <laughs> because we know her so well. <laughs> uh, we're just coming up. We're finishing here. Um, I, I do want to point out Cindy Silva was the one who was standing behind the podium um, where other people were holding up signs. She was um, 
helping us on uh, some statewide issues. Uh, but Sam, I want to thank you and, and your colleagues at the League of California Cities for all the work you do to help, as I say, herd us cats together, us politicians, uh, to keep us together. Uh, Nicolo and Andre, thank you, thank you for helping save our local businesses, helping Danville secure um, numerous um, grants to help build a better community here, as we are that kind of limited service and not such a great deal on how Prop 13 worked out on our tax revenue. Um, that we need to find those those sources. So we want to thank you personally, and I want to, uh, and I also want to say one last thing, and I'll let you uh, say something. I really want to state, uh, thank uh, Senator Glazer and Assemblymember Rebecca Barakeha. They really listen to us. They spend time with us, not only because your voices, but they actually really listen. And when we send a letter, even if it's somebody else's bill, we make sure that they they know where we stand, and you guys help amplify that. So. Absolutely. I want to thank you all uh, and wish everybody a happy 4th of July. And remember, for those here in Danville, the 4th of July parade starts at 9 a.m. It's near San Juan Valley High School. It does head south. It is slightly shorter for security reasons and some other reasons this year. The parade does stop at Town and Country um, Road at uh, on San Juan Valley Boulevard. And that's physically where the Bank of America and uh, Wells Fargo is. Um, please join us. But remember... Don't put your chairs out till the night before. All right. Thanks a lot, everybody. It's great to see you. And again, be safe, be well. And uh, thanks for all the work you do. Thank, Thank you very, very much. Have a safe right, and forth. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, all.